Now, if you've watched my other videos, you've probably heard me mention a few times that I live and work in South Korea. Just by living here, reading extensively on it, uh, teaching in the political science department and so on, I often find myself answering questions from back people back home every time North Korea is in the news. We'll start by looking at Red Dawn, a remake of a movie from the Cold War about Russia invading the US and a small group of Americans that wage a guerrilla war. The movie was remade in 2012 with North Korea basically being swapped in instead of Russia because no one would have bought an invasion by Russia. The premise of the film is so outlandish as to be comical. Here's the reality of North Korea's military capability. Yes, they have tremendous manpower with about a million active duty soldiers in the military. But their weapons from fighter jets to tanks are outdated, and they can't even afford fuel for regular training. There are exactly two things frightening about North Korea's military capabilities. One, the damage it could do to South Korea. And two, nuclear weapons. Eventually. It's true that if an all-out war did break out again on the peninsula, Seoul is likely to be decimated by an artillery barrage. Half the population of South Korea lives in Seoul. This kind of attack would be absolutely devastating by every measure. Expanded nuclear capabilities are also generally considered an unequivocally bad thing. We do believe North Korea has the ability to manufacture a nuclear warhead. And experts argue back and forth about exactly how powerful their nukes are and what technical capability they have for actually using a nuclear warhead, putting it on a missile, how far that missile can travel, and so on. Most agree, though, that if they continue to work on it, they will eventually be a threat to North America. The James Bond film Die Another Day chose to explore North Korea's capacity for cutting-edge technological research. And, again, they got it exactly wrong. The North Korean leadership is not stupid. They know they don't have a lot of resources to work with, and they wouldn't gamble everything on speculative fantasy technology. In fact, I would say they've been quite smart about how they've invested their money. They've stuck to investments that are proven, have a track record, and they know that they're going to make a profit from them. That's an interesting choice of words, right? I said profit. We know that they've invested heavily in narcotics manufacture and trafficking, for example. Money they make off of the narcotics trade supposedly go directly to the top leadership, basically the Kim family. And yes, they've invested in nuclear weapons. Think about this. What does North Korea have to offer the world? Very little in the way of resources. Economically, it can't compete on the world stage. Literally, the only thing it can bring to any negotiating table is its military threat. And it uses that military threat expertly. It uses scary language and military provocations just enough to get the media nervous. They know that once it's got its name in the headlines again, stock markets will start to destabilize and these capitalist countries will scramble to try to protect their economies. That includes just giving them cash and uh, food support and so on to get them to keep quiet for a while. Team America World Police is probably the most famous movie that deals with North Korea, and it portrays the late leader Kim Jong-il as a total nut job. By all accounts, Kim Jong-il was certainly eccentric, but in terms of overall strategies that he followed, he was actually quite brilliant in how they played the cards they were dealt. Now there was a brief period of time where it had more infrastructure in place by the time the fighting of the Korean War stopped, effectively giving it a head start. So maybe Kim Il-sung, the first leader of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, the DPRK, honestly thought he was leading his people towards a worker's paradise. But Kim Jong-il, and now Kim Jong-un especially, each inherited a much bleaker reality, that their system is not working. For these two, and really the entire elite class that supports them, Simple survival for as long as possible is the goal now. They know that if war breaks out again, they're in for either a quick death or prison for the rest of their lives. 
This means that any renewed conflict at all, especially launching a nuclear missile against the, a world power like the United States, is basically suicide. Okay, so back to trying to tie this all in with film. There is one film that is somewhat close to reality. It's quite a stretch, and I'm almost embarrassed to say it. But the film The Interview does have some interesting parallels uh, with the, you know, a few years back when Dennis Rodman, the famous basketball player, and the Harlem Globetrotters were invited to come visit North Korea for the basketball diplomacy, along with Vice magazine. I've been thinking a little bit about the mission. Okay. America, you know, always putting its nose in things and screwing them up. The truth is, Kim is a master at manipulating the media. Yeah. You're the media. You get what's happening here? Maybe the media is manipulating you. I'm the only one who spent real time with him, all right? Spent face-to-face -face time. It's just, man, I can sympathize with people that get dumped on by the media. And it sucks. <laughs> it's amazing, man. Wow, man. You know what? It was such uh, a great experience. Uh, me and my, uh, I call him my son, Elkin King. Um, we went there, man, and it wasn't supposed to be like that. I'll it was supposed to be like, you just meet the guy and just have a good time. And it turned into such an event. And I have right. to ask you first, when you said you love Kim and think he's awesome, were you aware of his threats to destroy the United States and, and his regime's horrendous record on human rights? The underlying lesson here is that North Korea is interested in keeping everything exactly the way it is now. Uh, stability and survival. But the same can be said for Russia, China, the United States, Japan, and the rest of the region. Outside of North Korea, the East Asian economies are tied together so closely that if the Korean War started up again, it would be an epic disaster for the entire region. There are even indications that China, North Korea's closest ally, is getting kind of fed up with North Korea and might not help it in a renewed conflict. In fact, thanks to the diplomatic cables released by WikiLeaks, we know that China does have a plan in place. It might not be the only plan, but it does have one plan where uh, they could allow South Korea to occupy North Korea in the event that North Korea, the North Korean system collapses. In other words, they wouldn't challenge South Korea in an attempt to uh, put boots on the ground to help stabilize the peninsula. If you want to get an idea about North Korea's technical capabilities, then I suggest you do whatever you can to watch a film called Pulgasari. This movie was made in North Korea in 1985. Now, consider that Kim Jong-il was in charge while this movie was being made, and this was his pet project. He was putting all of his energy and resources into making this movie. He's known to have been a huge film buff, and he really wanted to create this very impressive North Korean film industry. This went to such an extent that he authorized a military operation to kidnap a South Korean movie director and actress off the streets of Korea, of South Korea, uh, to work on films in North Korea. Honestly, the film is pretty unwatchable. The production values, the special effects are just really bad. I mean, if you compare it to the original King Kong movies, it looks like it's about the same level. And King Kong came out in 1933. 1933. Let's see, what Hollywood movies came out in 1985? Well, Back to the Future, the Goonies, Rambo 2, Weird Science, 007 View to a Kill, Mad Max 3, Cocoon, Commando, Legend, Spies Like Us, Day of the Dead, Death Wish 3, Real Genius, The Jewel of the Nile. So while the North Korean government was pouring resources into producing Pulgasari, expecting it to be a shining example of what the country is capable of, Hollywood answered with 14 technologically superior films without breaking a sweat. Could I include The Breakfast Club as technologically superior? I'm going to say yes. So let's make that 15. So to summarize, North Korea's technical capabilities shown in any movie where North Korea has some kind of super advanced doomsday weapon is just absolutely absurd. Yes, its nuclear weapons are a serious problem for the international community. But keep in mind that North Korea's whole purpose for developing nuclear weapons is to ensure its own survival. 
and actually using those weapons would be the end of the country. The most accurate depiction of anything related to North Korea was not in a film or TV show at all, but a video game. The game Mercenaries, Playground of Destruction, takes place in a post-collapsed North Korea where different powers control different areas of the country, and mercenaries are brought in to help stabilize the situation. This is actually a plausible scenario for a North Korean collapse, although maybe not probable. A North Korean collapse would be a disaster, and every player in the region would have to cooperate. However, considering how deeply indoctrinated the North Korean people are against outsiders, it would really have to be South Korea, and you know maybe China, uh, that would have troops on their ground in North Korea. You know, other actors, the United States, Japan, especially, but also Russia, and you know even China would probably be better off being a little bit more supportive. Uh, and all these countries would have the, that's more of a supporting role, most likely. And yes, they would be contracting out to all different types of uh, contractors, possibly even, you know, uh, mercenaries in terms of, you know, having a police force and training the police, a new police force and things uh, to support the rebuilding of the country. If you're interested in learning more about the situation between North and South, I'd actually recommend looking to some South Korean media uh, for some really interesting and thought-provoking films. The movie Taegukki actually takes place during the Korean War. JSA is about a fictional event that takes place in the very tense demilitarized zone between North and South Korea. And then Shilmido is a pretty interesting story, and it's a true story of these South Korean death row prisoners that are given a second chance at life by training for a suicide mission to up in North Korea. Shidi is kind of a spy movie, and it's an interesting one too. It's, it's entirely fictional as far as we know, uh, but it does present an interesting scenario because we do know that there are North Korean spies living in South Korea. And it is pretty interesting to think about how after a couple of decades of living under deep cover in South Korea and seeing with their own eyes the stark difference between the systems, would they carry out their orders if they were suddenly get, received an order to, you know, have some kind of terrorist attack against the South Korean target? I don't know. It's a good question. Okay, so to summarize, we talked about the, the new Red Dawn movie, Die Another Day, the James Bond movie, Team America World Police, The Interview, the video game Mercenaries, Playground of Destruction, the South Korean films, JSA, Taeguki, and Shomido. And also Pulgasari, right? Don't forget Pulgasari, the North Korean film. I hope this video has been enlightening about the real risks opposed to what you see in the headlines when there's some breaking story that North Korea poses to other countries especially those outside of Asia. Thanks for watching.